what is an allergy? What, when you see, hear the word allergy, what do you think? A reaction to something you ate or inhaled. No, a, a reaction to something. And how does that usually manifest itself? You know, when we usually My do. grandson had a reaction this morning. He is covered with poison oak. Well, that's a, usually an allergic reaction. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you think of runny nose, sneezing, cough, rash, but you don't very often think of gallbladder, do you? Uh -uh. And you don't ever think of, sometimes you might think of diarrhea, or sometimes you might think of headaches. But basically, if we keep it real simple, an allergy is a reaction to something that most people tolerate. You react to something that most other people do not react to. Poison oak's kind of obvious, but, but a lot of people don't get poison oak. So no matter what we're talking about, if it's an allergic thing, there are people that don't react. So if you keep that in mind, you don't worry about your blood test or your scratch test or <clears throat> some sort of a special new test they've got. It's basically a reaction. Now, a little more advanced type of science is the what they call electrodermal testing or you can challenge someone electrically and the resistance to an electrical impulse at, on their skin will change if they're allergic to something. Or you can do muscle testing. <clears throat> and uh, I talked to a lady yesterday who had been to Mexico for, or his, her, their family member went to Mexico for cancer treatment. And it was, a, it was a great place, it seems to me, because every day, they didn't just have a protocol for her type of cancer. Every day they would muscle test her or do electrodermal testing to see what kind of therapy she needed. And she was doing great. <clears throat> but most doctors get a protocol and they stick to it. They're gonna, this is what we do, no matter what your cancer is or how you do tomorrow, or, you know, we're gonna do it. But anyway, let's get back to allergies. If you keep that in mind, the reaction to what most people tolerate, it helps you understand why allergies are really very, almost universal. <clears throat> so if we look at the first thing here, and see so here's, here's a couple of great books on allergies. One, one is called The Basics of Food Allergies, and another one's called, but both these are almost 40 years old, and they don't teach this much anymore. Oh, sure, they, I, and I can't say I know what the curriculum is in the medical schools, <laughs> but for the most part, well, let's listen to what this one author said. In 1959, what's that, 50 years ago? Almost? No, more than 50, mm -hmm. isn't it? More. Uh, Basics of Food Allergies, this is the author of this, this is from that book. I was impressed with the importance of food allergy and illnesses not always considered allergic. Now here's just an example of that. You see this in your, in your hand out here? You, how close do you like this, Dan? Oh, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> These are examples of allergic reaction, but that's not what the diagnosis those children are going to get. They're going to get a one of the some sort of a mental disorder. It's ADD, AD, you know, attention deficit or whatever. Just a bad kid. <laughs> but you see what happens when a child is exposed to milk changes the writing. They start writing backward. They're called dyslexic. They go into special ed. And it may just be because they got the school lunch or school breakfast when they got to school, which is almost always milk and some sort of wheat product and a bunch of sugar. And then you wonder why they can't sit still. It destroys lives. Because a child is always writing like this any one of these examples, they're considered have, to have a learning disability, and they can't learn. If all the words you see on the page are backwards, it's very difficult to learn. But unless a doctor or a school nurse or a parent is aware that that could be caused by a food allergy, it's, it's very, very good. It's a lifetime result. <coughs> okay, he went on to say, I've since found among physicians in general there exists widespread lack of appreciation that food allergy might cause symptoms. Medical school criteria, certain curricula have rarely emphasized the importance of food allergy in the etiology of many disorders including duodenal ulcer, 
gallbladder disease, urinary tract infection, arthritis, learning disability, mental disorders, heart disease, colitis, on and on. Therefore, there's little reason to hope that physicians of the future are to be any more appreciative of the importance of food allergy. Hmm. So keep that in mind when you or a friend or a family member has a problem. Sometimes you, getting this in understanding is, is very frustrating because we all have family members that we know ways they can get better, but they aren't interested. Right. Sometimes they get sick enough, they'll, in desperation, it's like, well, I've tried chemotherapy and I've tried radiation and they, and they amputated such and such. Can't you fix me now with your herbal remedies? <laughs> it's very, very frustrating, but you got to learn to keep your mouth shut unless they ask for help. Okay, so <clears throat> what do you do if you think you have an allergy? Well, let's, let's, go, let's talk a little bit about why do you get an allergy? It's a little bit like the guy that starts smoking at 15. Any of you ever start smoking when you're 15? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of the thing to do. And I, I remember when I, my friends start smoking, I'd, they'd say, well, why don't you try it? So I'd try it, and I'd you know, pop, pull some smoke in and blow it out. And then I'd say, no, inhale it. You know, when you first inhale, you cough and you spit, and it's awful. But if you keep it up, you see your body gets tolerant. Well, let's say you, you got so you tolerated it, and you smoked for 20 years, and then you start coughing, and you go to the doctor, and he says, oh, you've been smoking for 20 years, and no wonder. He said, well, it couldn't be cigarettes, because I've been smoking for 20 years. Well, see, it's the same way with food. You might be eating a food, but let's try and understand why that happens. Why do you tolerate something for so long, and then all of a sudden it makes you sick? Okay. So I, I put a graph in here, so a couple of little pictures, to help you understand this. <clears throat> but maybe before we get to there, look at that picture on the back of the adrenal page, or the next page. <clears throat> this one here. <coughs> now, almost, well, I have to tell you, I'll probably all, always, <clears throat> an allergic reaction is a form of inflammation. <coughs> What happened to that person with poison oak? What happened to their skin? It got all red. And it may blister because it's inflamed. Okay? So there's a inflammation is good. It's part of our defense mechanism. But if it doesn't turn off, one little inflammation is sort of like driving on ice. You know, you don't just turn if you just turn one way, what happens? Your car starts to skid, and you just turn one way. What happens to the car? Haven't you ever done donuts in the parking lot? <laughs> you turn your wheel just one way, and you keep the gas on, and the car goes round in circles, hopefully. Okay? Well, so we get inflammation, but then pretty soon we want inflammation to go away. But we don't want it to go way away, but so we want inflammation, and pretty soon, these peaks and valleys become less and less, and we're back to where we were, ideally. See? You catch a virus, your body inflames, but your body's tough enough, you control it, and then pretty soon the inflammation goes away. But if, you, if, if you're not healthy, then the inflammation explodes. Now, some people think this Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, whatever they want to call it, is just acute scurvy has all the characteristics of acute scurvy. A very virulent virus and a poorly poor defense mechanism. But anyway, so you, we want your adrenal gland to react. If your adrenal gland reacts too much, you have what we call an, aller an allergy. No, but it doesn't react enough. When we get this chronic inflammation, we call it asthma, earaches, colitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, asthma, all these things. Inflammation. Because in any of those situations, if it's serious enough, what do they do to you in the emergency room? What's the first line of treatment usually? Adrenaline or cortisone? Yeah, cortisone. Now, where does cortisone originally come from? The adrenal gland. The adrenal gland. Okay, and that's why I have this picture here. I want you to understand that your adrenal gland's constantly trying to protect you because there's all sorts of inflammation going on in us minute to minute. And if your adrenal gland's healthy, 
then it can make the anti-inflammatory hormones you need to keep you from reacting. And so in that 18, 20-year-old, 25-year-old kid who's smoking, he's getting inflammation, but his glands and tissues are strong enough and healthy enough that he can cover it up. He isn't consciously aware, although his body's going through all these ups and downs as it protects him, but he, consciously he doesn't get a symptom. Okay? And so all these things, I've got these arrows going away from the adrenal gland here in this picture, and these are all things that create stress and create inflammation in you. Okay, so it's medication, it's pain, it's poorly digested food, constipation, etc., etc., all the way around that adrenal gland. Now, what helps your adrenal gland stay healthy? Well, nutrients. A very interesting story written in the, this book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, by <coughs> a dentist by the name of Weston Price. He traveled all around the world looking at the native indigenous people and wondered why they didn't get cancer and diabetes and heart attacks. And he found that they ate their local food. And when he got up north in the Indians, up in northern Canada, <coughs> and they didn't get colds, they didn't get cancer. And so he said, well, where do you get your vitamin C? And at first they wouldn't tell him. It was a sort of a tribal secret. <coughs> and finally he lived with them long enough that they, he gained their confidence. And they finally told him, he said, well, when we kill an elk or a moose or something like that, there's this little yellow thing on top of their kidney that we eat. And we eat their eyeballs. Well, that, well, what's that little yellow thing that sits on top of your kidney? Your adrenal gland. He said, we eat that, and, and well, of course, they eat the liver and all these other parts, but they eat these body parts that are very rich in vitamin C. <coughs> and so <coughs> vitamin C is one of the main nutrients that we need to, and I think that's one reason we have this vitamin C saturation test available to us. Very few vitamins we can take and, and on a, almost on a day-to-day -day basis determine how much we need. And one is vitamin C because we have the vitamin C saturation. And you take a little too much vitamin C, more than your body needs or can handle, you get intestinal symptoms. You get gas or loose stools. And you know, it's not, it's easily recognized and so it's very, very safe. So vitamin C is critical. And that's why Linus Pauling can write a book saying vitamin C in cancer, vitamin C in the common cold, and you know, on and on and on about vitamin C. So, are we taking enough vitamin C? Most people aren't. Most, yes. I was listening to the radio program the other day and there was a, a report on the news from Canada. This doctor was saying that there, are, there, are, there is no treatment that works for the common cold. He said people take <coughs> vitamin C and they're not doing a darn thing for themselves. Can you and imagine? he's on the radio too. Yeah, and he's on the radio, so <coughs> there are right. a lot of people that are going to believe that. Well, I know that vitamin C stops my colds in his. Well, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> most people, most of the tests that are done to try to refute Linus Pauling is they'll give a group of people 500 milligrams a day. Yeah, right. And then they say it doesn't work. <coughs> or maybe yeah. five milligrams. Yeah, now we just, next to a, a lady was testing to see if she needed a particular supplement. And the bottle says usual dose. That's all the label says. The usual dose. Or the do this dose has this much in it. And so the bottle says take one or two a day. She tested and she needed six. So she might take it for a while and say it doesn't work. So anyway, you've got to take enough of these things. I made a partial list here of things that, and on the back of that sheet, on the page facing it, or somewhere, I gave you a list of uh, adrenal gland supplements. And if you read books like, uh, you know, Adrenal Fatigue and <coughs> the Cortisol Connection or um, anything about chronic fatigue, you'll see this long list of supplements. And you don't know which ones you take and you don't know which dose you should take. And that's why it's critical. If you ever want to re achieve optimal health, you learn to do some sort of intuitive testing. You can douse, you can muscle test, you can learn to lean, there's just lots of ways of doing it. Don't think you can get away with it just by reading the label. <laughs> you can't. And so all these things have been shown, and people will advocate for these supplements in strengthening your adrenal gland. Which one do you need? That's your job.
you've got to figure out for yourself which of these sub funds you need and the right dose. So, and so if we look at this, this, this picture again, we see that as long as your adrenal gland can make more than your body's demanding, you aren't going to get sick. Now to further help you understand that, I'm going to do a couple of stick figures. <clears throat> now if you look at these, here's, here's what we've got to understand. Here's your health, and this is good health up here, and here is the amount of any particular nutrient you may be taking. Now, if you don't take any of that nutrient, you may not die immediately, but you're, you're going to die sooner than you need to. So if you don't take any, you're going to have poor health, and you're going to have... Uh, now, as you increase your intake of that nutrient, you will be healthier until you reach a point here, at this dose, where you're getting all the benefit you can out of that nutrient. It won't do you any more, it won't help you any more if you take more. And that's what we call the optimal dose. See, that's where you should be. Now, we, what I tried to demonstrate here, as the amount of stress in your life increases, it takes more and more of that same nutrient to get you up to optimal health. And this is just a measure of the degree of stress your body's under. So you've got to keep that in mind. The dose of your multiple vitamins, your supplements you're taking when everything's great, and things are really good in your life, then it takes less to get you up to your optimal health. Now, most of us can relate to the, to the fact that when the weather changes, when we don't get enough sleep, when we're traveling, we're much more vulnerable to getting sick. Classic example, a friend of mine, his wife got cancer, and he's, you know, he's going to the doctor, he's, he's with her at surgery, he was with her at radiation, he went through all this. Six, eight months later, she died. Six months later, he got diabetes. Because we've got to teach caregivers they've got to take care of themselves. Because once the stress goes away, our, our, our defense is... The adrenal gland has kind of three phases of action. One is called an alarm reaction, where it, it you know, the, a lion runs in the room, or a terrorist with guns and flak vests on, it comes in the room. What would happen to our heart rate and our blood pressure and all these things? But I'll be, anyway, be, so our adrenal gland should protect us. This is the, the fight or flight response. So your adrenal gland goes through this alarm phase. And so all these hormones are being generated in higher quantities. And it can keep that up for a certain period of time, depending upon the, the reserves you have. But eventually, it goes into a mode where you can't respond anymore. Your gas pedal's on the floor and you come to another hill, and you can't go any faster. I had a Volkswagen bug. I drove it to Denver one year. <laughs> and, and, you know, as we were going up, you know, it slowed down. We went about 35 miles an hour for many miles because you couldn't go any faster. Well, pretty soon, if you don't relieve that stress, it goes into the exhaustion phase, and then your ability to stop inflammation is pretty much gone. So you're... For some reason, he was susceptible to diabetes. He could have gotten arthritis. He could have had a heart attack. He could have gotten colitis. He could have any sort of thing. Any of these chronic conditions could have come along, depending upon his individual susceptibility. And we don't know. We can't look at a person and say, oh, this is what you're going to get if you get too much stress. You might. If you look at your family history and things like that, you might have a clue. And so this is, this is why we want on this chart, we want to try and find what our optimum dose is. Now, aside from vitamin C and magnesium, it's very, very difficult to do that without some sort of <coughs> intuitive testing. You, it's critical for you to achieve optimal health for you to learn intuitive testing. It's not that hard. It's, it's really not. You just have to do it. Okay. But how are you testing? 
That is another class. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you. A, you can use. You can use a pendulum. You train your brain to move the pendulum. You can work with someone else and do muscle testing, or you can just stand and hold it on your chest. And with a little practice, you can sense whether you're going towards it or away from it. Okay. Well, I can't. One of the next month, they may have a class on intuitive testing. Okay, so the closer you are to your optimal level of intake, then we, on this bottom stick figure, see, we see these lines. Here we have again, this time it's health and your age. And as you age, most of us get more vulnerable. We wear glasses, we get gray hair, we get wrinkles, all these things. Because we're wearing out. And that's that downward sloping line kind of wiggly because sometimes you aren't aging as quite as rapidly. It's not a straight line. Now, on the, the bottom line is just labeled stress. Those are things in our life that increase our need, accelerate aging. And you can see there's little peaks, and you see the, the first little peak in that stress line would be like the cold or the flu or pneumonia or something like that. It comes and goes. It goes back below our stress line. But then you see where the, chronic, the stress line crosses <coughs> your coping ability. That's what we call a chronic, that's diabetes, that's your heart attack, that's colitis. That's one of these other chronic conditions. And you can reverse it if you identify the fact that this is really the bottom line is what's happening. You can reverse that. It takes a lot of work. You know, this is when people go on juice fast and go someplace in a spa and they get massage and saunas and IV therapy. You can raise your level of resistance. It's a challenge. Can you actually reverse arthritis? Oh yeah, totally. Really? Fascinating book I just read. It, it was by the same dentist, <coughs> Weston A. Price. And the title of the book was Price on Root Canals. And this, it's, it's a fascinating book. It was, it was written a hundred years ago. Shortly after the development of x-rays, they had x-rays. And what these, they had pictures of these people that crippled with arthritis. One lady said, I'd rather be dead. They t had to take her children away from her. She couldn't feed herself. And what he found, now this isn't the only thing. He found that when you pull the root, pull the tooth out that has the root canal in it, her arthritis went away. Six or eight months later, her kids were all back with her. She was feeding her mother <coughs> before she couldn't even make a fist. It's fascinating. Another, another example, I know we're getting a little bit off here. A person had <coughs> a bad root canal, and he also had, I think it's conjunctivitis or uveitis or something, a chronic infection in one eye. One eye had already gone blind. They took the root the tooth with the root canal out. They culture, the, you, once you do a root canal, you cannot sterilize that. The body can't clean it up. You, it's always chronically infected. Mm. They took that culture, they cultured that, the tip of the tooth, they just ground up the bottom of the tooth. Then they took what they cultured and injected it into rabbits, and rabbits got conjunctivitis. They did six or seven rabbits, and they all got conjunctivitis in the same eye that that guy was affected. That's, that is mind-boggling. That is 100 years old and we don't hear about it. What was the name of the book? It's, you can't get it anymore. You can't get it online? Oh. No, I tried. I tried to get Amazon. I've I got a dentist in my family and I tried to want him to have a copy. But anyway, it's a fascinating. And he created arthritis and paralysis in rabbits just from and when you got the right tooth out, things got better. You can reverse these things. Now, a lot of doctors call reversal of diabetes and colitis and cancer uh, spontaneous remissions. And that's where I'm, I, I don't know the answer, therefore, and there's no answer, therefore, just... There is a book called, called The Root Canal Cover-Up. Yeah, that's right. There's another one called Uninformed Consent. Okay. You can get that one, too. That, those are available. This one, though, is, it isn't really a... A dentist collected these papers from Dr. Price and put them in a book. It's, it's just it's just fascinating. I mean, you can, 
Mm -hmm. one. Well, there's one called, what's the one you said? The you root canal cover-up. Root canal. Who's, who's the author? Um, I can't remember his name. Well, anyway, the root canal cover-up. The other one is uninformed <laughs> consent. There's act. I mean, I don't want to, there's some professions that actually tend to make us worse. <laughs> Medical, dental. <laughs> Because, you know, they, for a hundred years they put amalgams in our mouth, and they still, their, their mother organization refused to accept the fact that it's bad for you. Even though the government comes into every dental office and says, you've got to have a mercury extraction unit in this, or we're going to put you out of business. But yet they keep saying it's okay. Put the mouth in silver and mercury mouth. Anyway, bottom line is, uh, this, on this, this, graph here, you see that when you're, when this top graph, you aren't optimal, then you're going to die much quicker. See, ideally, if we were where we should be on this, on this graph, <coughs> we would, we would live like this gradually and then die quick. See, that's, you die when you feel well. You know, it's the way we should. But most of us, you know, it's like this, and then we keep people alive, you know, if you're unfortunate enough to get aborted, that's too bad, but if you get born, we'll keep you alive for hundreds of thousands of dollars. We keep people alive because it's good, for, it's good business, you know? <clears throat> and so, anyway, so the quicker, closer you are to your optimal intake of your nutrients, whether it's from your food or whether it's from supplements, the, the healthier your life is going to be. And that's why it's so important. That's why you get, <clears throat> I'll give you a personal example. When I was about 12, my family got uprooted. <clears throat> we moved in Portland to Corvallis. We moved in June. We moved <clears throat> into a home that the backyard was five acres of grass. And ever since then, I've had hay fever because I was stressed out. You know, back in 1949, you've, uh, People didn't know about vitamins, but you go trick or treating and get a shot bag full of candy bars in a half hour. And there's lots of sugar. It was cheap after the war and everything like that. So I moved into this a huge grass exposure and a very stressful time in my life. And ever since then, I've had hay fever because my body got sensitized because my adrenal gland couldn't control that inflammation because it's so busy dealing with the sugar. You know, a snack in the afternoon was a gallon or a quart of milk and half a pack of hydrox cookies. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't homogenized enough, but anyway. And so if we if we want to stay up here, we've got to we've got to get on that, that upper we've got to optimize our intake. And which ones of these things if you keep your adrenal gland healthy, you're probably not going to get a chronic disease. Okay, so now let's say you do what make, how do you know if you've got an allergy? You've been to the doctor and he says it's chronic bronchitis, or chronic sinusitis. I've seen so many people, they've been to the doctor two or three times every year for a course of antibiotics because they get sinus infections or they get bronchial infections. And you probably know people like that or you may be one. Because doctors or how many had children who had recurrent earaches? And what did the doctors do? Well, they gave you antibiotics so they, they got tired of doing that, then they would take out your tonsils. They took out my brother's tonsils, and they said to me, as my, actually my grandfather, they said, well, we're taking out Dave's tonsils, well, we might as well take out yours. <laughs> I mean, that's how <laughs> flippant they were. With the guy. Because why do people get tonsillitis? Why do people get sinusitis? Guess. Their adrenals are... It's allergies. It's almost 100% of the time it's allergies. But unless you I think of that, unless you think of it, you're never going to try to deal with the problem. And almost always in a kid with recurrent urinary tract infections, recurrent earaches, it's almost always milk, at least milk. Yes, Kirk? Yeah, they do. Uh, they take your kidney out or you get another kidney, do you get the adrenal with it or do they exist? Usually they'll take, it's pretty tough. The, the adrenal gland sits pretty much on top of that kidney. Now you can separate them and I, 
ideally you probably could, but the blood supply is a little tricky and it's not a real easy place to get to. So I'm not sure what currently they're doing. I think we usually try to save the adrenal gland, but you can get along pretty well in one adrenal gland if life isn't too stressful. Can the adrenal gland sit on, on, stay in the donor or does it have to come out? Oh, you mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. If you ever donate, ask if you can save your adrenal gland. <laughs> You may ask you for a kidney one day. You really love me? Give me your kidney. <laughs> okay, so what do you do? Well, one of the first things you need to do, you think, keep a journal. <clears throat> Write down when you get your symptoms. You know, try and, if it's day, night, after meals, but if you don't eat, if you do eat, uh, winter, summer, keep track. Because, especially if you go to a doctor, it, it, it can really help the doctor. The good doctors will say, if you ask the right questions, the patient will give you the answer. But if you don't know the right questions, or if you haven't kept a journal, and sometimes your doctor may not want it, but you keep it for your own. Because a lot of times you can take care of these things yourself. <clears throat> okay, keep a journal. <clears throat> and then, probably one of the first things you should do is eliminate grains. Somewhere, I've got the book Dangerous Grains, and in that book, these doctors relate to the fact that <clears throat> there's at least 150 different medical conditions that could be caused by grain sensitivity, mainly wheat. So one of the simplest, easiest things to do is just eliminate grains. Go on the paleo diet. You've got to be compulsive, though. You, if you're doing that as a, as a method of trying to find out what's going on. You cannot eat out. <laughs> you have to read all your own, make all your own foods. And you have to <clears throat> read labels very carefully. And really, I think if you have more than two or three ingredients, then you probably shouldn't eat it in there during this period of time. Because most of the time, we don't know what those ingredients are. <clears throat> so keep a journal. <clears throat> and then try limiting grain. If, if that doesn't solve the problem, then I'd encourage you to think about doing a short fast. Now, one of the best questions you can ask yourself or someone else, if they suspect food allergies, is to, how do you feel if you don't eat? Now, if someone is a smoker, how do you feel if you quit smoking? <laughs> you know, it's not pleasant. Or some people, how do you feel if you quit drinking coffee? Now, allergies and addiction are, are really a gray, there's a gray area of the difference. It's hard to distinguish sometimes which is which. And one is very often related to another. For example, if you have an intestinal, what we call dysbiosis, <coughs> where you got the bad kind of bacteria growing in your gut, and almost everybody does. Certain foods, actually, those bacteria actually convert those foods into a morphine-like substance. And some very other, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and a few things like that. Very toxic chemicals, just from the, the wrong kind of bacteria being in your gut. Now, if they're converting grain into morphine-like chemicals, these morphine-like chemicals are very addictive. Have you ever been eating a big Thanksgiving dinner that you go in your in the kitchen and look in the refrigerator, like <laughs> you need some more, something else to eat. That's the but the quickest way to find out if foods may be the problem, it's not infallible, would be to quit eating for 24 hours. Now, you, if let's say you ate dinner tonight and you didn't eat breakfast and you didn't eat lunch, <coughs> you should still feel pretty good. You shouldn't have headaches, you shouldn't be irritable, you shouldn't be shaky, you shouldn't be, you know, ravenously hungry. You should be hungry but nothing else. Now if you cannot do that, almost always it's your food allergy has become a food addiction and you are going into the withdrawal phase of your addiction. It's really good, I don't, I don't know if you follow Mercola's website or <coughs> some of you, one of the latest things is what they call intermittent fasting. They say it's a great way for some, for some people to lose weight. You don't have to really change your, you should be on a wholesome diet, I'll, but you basically you don't have to change your diet. 
You just have to limit the time during which you eat. So you can eat, say, from 10 to 6 or from 8 to 4. And you limit to a 10 or 12 hour period during the day and people do amazing things. But you should be able to go 24 hours. And people that go 24 hours without eating, at least once a month, live about 10% longer. But nothing else, that's a good thing, if you're feeling good. <laughs> Let's do the other thing. So here's a way, this lemon juice fast is another way, because <clears throat> drinking the lemon juice with the, with the maple syrup, you, you really, you're going to get some calories, so you really won't get hungry. The first day or two, you're going to probably feel bad. Has anybody ever done the lemon juice fast? How do you do on it, Millie? That's terrible at first. Yeah, and then what happens? And then you feel good. Yeah. After about the third day, you feel yeah. wonderful. And what do you think is going on those first three days? You're detoxifying. Yeah, or withdrawing. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, so you got to be prepared for that. <coughs> but most people, someone else raised their hand over here. Anyone else? How did you feel after the second or third day? Um, I didn't go that far, but... Did okay. Feel better. Yeah, you've got to go at least. See, once we eat something, for, before to get completely in and out, it takes three to four days. And that's why you've got to, it helps take a laxative first, so that accelerates getting rid of it. <coughs> but you've got to give it time so you're not withdrawing. But most people say, after the third day, I feel so good, I don't want to eat again. I mean, it's amazing. What does, the, what does that maple syrup do to a diabetic? Well, you're not eating anything else. You'd have to watch your sugars. I mean, probably won't have much effect because the total caloric intake isn't going to be, total carbohydrate intake isn't going to be very great. Very minimal. Oh, you can probably use stevia. I don't know. But you need a few calories or you're, you won't be able to fast after the first day or so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so... Consider it if you've got some sort of a chronic condition. It's amazing what clears up. <laughs> now, another, another big clue is, is the idea that some people, like my hay fever, so, you know, it starts coming on in May and lasts till about the 1st of July. So, you know, it doesn't take a real scientist to figure out, hey, maybe you got, especially in southern Willamette Valley, you know. <clears throat> we could level the mountains out in Cottage Grove. Maybe that stuff would go further south. <coughs> be glad you didn't live in, live in San Diego because the grass pollen goes from like March or until December. <laughs> no. no, we can't complain much about the weather here. I have a yeah. question. You say anything can be cured. Why isn't your hay fever cured? It is pretty much now. Oh, good. Well, I haven't done enough. See, I don't do the, sa the saturation all the time. I'm lazy. I I've gotten to a point like where I tol I'm, I'm well enough that I don't want to do more. <laughs> so, yeah. But you see, it's something like this. You, it's not a cure, then it's gone. So I'm always probably going to be susceptible. Because I don't know if you can undo the imprint you get from the antibody production from the initial insult. insult. Yeah. But see, if <coughs> consider yourself like a barrel. This go on the conveyor belt of life. But as this barrel goes down the conveyor belt, it shrinks. Now, there's, there's hoses leading into your barrel from, the, from life, stress. And, but as long as your barrel isn't full, you're not symptomatic. Now, if I've got a spot in my prostate that's cancer, but I never have symptoms with it, am I cured? Well, I don't know. That's kind of, you know, a silly rhetorical question. <clears throat> we all have some abnormality. We all have cancer cells in us. You know, if, if you've had the diagnosis of cancer, you you just had more of them. But as long as your body's immune system is not letting it grow, you're going to be fine. 80% 80, 80 or so of men over 80 have prostate cancer. If they if they took their prostate after they died and, and looked at it carefully, 80% of them will have prostate cancer, but only about 5% of them ever get clinical prostate cancer, and fewer than that die of it. So if you get to be 80, don't worry about prostate cancer. <laughs> don't let them operate on it. <clears throat> okay. And chemicals. Chemical reactions are huge, and we're seeing more and more of that as we've, we've become energy efficient. I worked in a three-story office building in Eugene for 20 years. 
And it was so efficient that if someone clear at the other end of the office, uh, top floor, was smoking, we'd smell it in, in our store. But first away. Because they, to be efficient, they recycle things. And so these, these are dangerous places to work because they're full of synthetic things and chemicals damage your immune system. And the other thing they, <coughs> they do, let's... <coughs> let's just say this is a kidney cell. We'll put, let's put a, yeah, we'll say a kidney, or an intestinal cell. And this is the way you were born. This is the way it's supposed to be made. Now, you've got these little cells, these immune cells, that before you're even born, they're circulating around, <laughs> bumping into these things, and getting to recognize them. Okay, so they, that's why we don't react to ourselves. That's why they used to take fetal animal kidneys and other body parts and transplant them into people because a fetal cell is doesn't have an immuno doesn't create an immunologic response. Okay, but once we get a little bit older, our immune system is more sensitive. But anyway, because the first few months of life you're just kind of getting to know yourself. And so these immune cells <laughs> collect all this data and so here's your colon cell. And so when you're 50, your immune system hits that colon cell and says, oh, this is a colon cell. I'm not going to produce an antibody to it. <clears throat> My dog, I can walk home. He's behind the fence in the backyard. I walk home at night, and he sees me walking up the driveway. He might bark, she might bark once. As soon as I get a little close, she stops barking. <clears throat> if I put a hat on, she barks all the way till I'm right next to her and I say something. Now, what's the difference? She doesn't recognize me. She doesn't me. recognize me. Now, <clears throat> when we get exposed to things like viruses and chemicals, a whole bunch of things, these cells get altered. Now, which cell is going to get altered? We don't know. <clears throat> if you've got colitis, most likely your colon cells got, I, uh, you know, got altered. If you've got MS, it's probably your nervous system or a blood vessel. But now you, your colon cells look sort of like this. <clears throat> so now this cell comes along and says, oops, that's not Joe. So I've, my job is to make antibodies to protect Joe from anything that I don't recognize. And so anything that can change the nature of, of who we are is going to increase our risk of becoming allergic. And the other huge thing, <coughs> and this, this is, I think, very, very interesting, <coughs> our cell membranes aren't just a little, like a, a rubber glove, you know, you fill it with water and it stretches, and it's, it's, they're very complex, and they're mainly fats. The cell membranes are mainly different kinds of fats. Saturated fats kind of protective and allow shape. <coughs> Inside here we have <coughs> unsaturated fats that <coughs> allow the transport of various things from the external environment into the inside of the cell. Now, <coughs> when they changed, when Crisco was invented, that's kind of the tipping point. Crisco is not a healthy fat. Your body doesn't know what to do with Crisco. And so, but it needs these fats. And so it incorporates some of those molecules into the cell membrane. So they aren't going to work right. When we get certain types of infection, one of the huge things that alter this is, is statin medication. Statin medications don't just interfere with your production of CoQ10, they do a whole lot of other things that have to do with the structure of your cells. And so not only are we in inundating ourselves environmentally with chemicals and, <clears throat> and then we, in our diet, uh, we drink all this junk, but we are, our diet has been transformed into 
one of unhealthy fat, so the cell membranes aren't going to work as well. And so if you, cells that are that get are misshapen from the moment they're made are also going to stimulate an immune response. And so we've got all these things working against us that creates an environment where we are likely to get, probably most of us, I don't know if you've been watching, but <clears throat> the list of things they now consider autoimmune disease is growing exponentially. You know, it used to be what well, if you had lupus or multiple sclerosis or now it's diabetes and heart disease and probably cancer or could be autoimmune. But if you have a chemical exposure and it damages a cell and <clears throat> the cell that you reproduce or you, because of the inflammation created by your own immune system is abnormal, then it's going to divide abnormally. You know, this could be the beginning of a cancer. So it's important <coughs> that we eat good stuff, and it's never too late. <laughs> Sometimes you think, oh, geez, I'm 60 or 70 or whatever, and I just might as well get... No, don't. You can, you can slow down the progression of any disease if you're willing to put in the time. <clears throat> okay, so that's one reason why you want to minimize your exposure to chemicals. I had a good friend that <clears throat> he is working, and he, and he and his wife retired and their life was going to be great because they felt pretty good. And So they bought a new manufactured home in a gated community <clears throat> and within six months she had an autoimmune disease. And, you know, we, what do you say to people that bought a new home and it's probably killing them? <laughs> They're very reluctant to move out of that home. And, and the other real tragedy is that she was being seen at the medical school. And, of course, they didn't see any, any correlation between moving into that new home and this autoimmune disease. <coughs> and that's, that's the difficult. That's just like he said here. There's not much hope in the criteria of medical education that because it's too profitable to treat these diseases. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. That I, I remember once, and my wife never lets me forget this. She was, <coughs> when we were in training, we, the, the staff on the hospital would have the, the trainee fam wives especially <coughs> come to their homes for socials. <coughs> My wife went to home and it was in the home of a, a, a general surgeon. He was a busy doctor, and, and, and they were trying to teach these young medical wives uh, how to behave appropriately. And she said, now this doesn't represent all doctors, but <laughs> she said, when, you, when your husband gets a call in the middle of the night, don't begrudge that, because that might be your new couch. <laughs> she does, that doesn't represent all doctors thinking, but uh, it, it's not um, it's not rare either. It's, but it's huge business, and it's it's getting so. I'll get a little political here. It's getting so. It's becoming more and more difficult to take care of yourself because they don't want you to. And it's getting more and more. Th I saw an article recently where the there's going to be a. There used to be. They're just state medical boards now but they're connected with this Federation of State Medical Boards, and now the Federation of State Medical Boards wants to control what the, the state medical boards do. And who, get, who do you think pays for the, the Federation of State Medical Boards? It's the pharmaceutical industry. And they own the insurance companies. So the only way you're going to really protect yourself is to stay out of the system. And the only way you're going to stay out of the system is you are courageous enough to learn to take care of yourself. It's hard. You may get away with it. Remember what we talked about last? What does it cost you out of pocket to have a heart attack? Well, the, the total bill for heart attacks in Lane County in 2012 was a million dollars. And Forbes, I think it was Forbes, said, <coughs> if you're six years older, you better have at least $200,000 available for out of pocket costs for your medical care. That's average. But don't worry, we've got a. We've got Universal health care, and it's good. You can keep your doctor. In. <laughs> okay, autoimmunity. We talked about that. Here, I put a little list down here for gallbladder. Gallbladder problems are all, I mean, I don't know. I won't ask for a show of hands. Women have, still have the gallbladders, but 
<clears throat> it's very, very common procedure. When I was in training, it was so common 40 years ago even, that I worked with a surgeon that from the time the, per the patient was put to sleep and ready to operate on, he could open her up, take out her gallbladder, and soar back up in less than 15 minutes. That's how many wow. he did. He was really good. It was fun to work with him because he was really an artist. <laughs> just I, I hear about that very often. People, uh, you know, a friend of mine, girlfriend, she just went in and had her gallbladder taken out. It's just like, it's, I hear it quite often. Yeah, it's, it's a very common procedure. I don't know percentage-wise. But <clears throat> people that have gallbladder pain, now this, this information came from Jonathan Wright, and he's a pretty smart guy. He found when people have gallbladder pain, pain in the right upper side of your abdomen, right below your ribs, sometimes it's in your back. People that quit eggs, 92% of the time they got better. But eggs and pork and onions and turkey and milk, all these things cause gallbladder pain. What is it in the egg? Is it cholesterol? What, what difference does it make? No, I'd like to know what it is. Why? <laughs> you want to get a cholesterol-free egg? <laughs> I no, don't know, no. and I, they never talk about that. But but you try. I mean, if you really want to eat eggs, you can say, okay, I'm going to quit eggs, and if the pain goes away, you can try egg yolks or egg whites if you really, or duck eggs or. I eat egg yolks. Yeah. Well, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if if you had gallbladder pain that got better without eggs, mm -hmm. and you really loved your eggs, you could experiment. Yeah, I and just wonder what was causing <laughs> it in the egg. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Okay, anyone with a chronic condition consider allergies. Okay, so what do you do? Let's say you've got a food or you've got a chemical. If you can, you avoid it. You're going to be better off if you can avoid it. Now, some people say if you avoid <clears throat> Why do people get food allergies? Well, one of the reasons is that you don't digest your food. See, we're, we're, at least they used to be taught in school <coughs> that when you eat a food... Here's your intestinal tract. Food comes in, and ideally, you know, the food you, that you take in will just uh, call that that's what your food, and it should come down and be broken down to little things like this. And when these things get absorbed, you don't get a reaction. Your immune system says, oh, that's food. And so it just ignores it. But most of us have terrible eating habits. We eat too fast, we eat up tight, we don't chew our food, we've got dental problems, all these things. Our gallbladder doesn't work anyway. And so a lot of this stuff comes through that looks like this. Now, a lot of times we think, well, that'll never get absorbed. Well, that's wrong. Because very few people get through life without chronic inflammation in their gut. Anybody here never taken antibiotics? Anybody here never <coughs> had a drink of alcohol? Okay. Well, you're you're in the minority, man. <laughs> That's great. But you don't have both alcohol and antibiotics out of your life. See, you know, got you one way or another. It's just almost impossible to do things to avoid doing things to, that increases inflammation in the gut when it's inflamed. It's just like your skin. You skin your elbow. What happens? It oozes, doesn't it? Because you've lost that barrier, and so lymph comes out. If you skin yourself bad enough, it'll be blood and lymph. And the same thing happens. This gets leaky. And so then you start absorbing some of these big food particles and your body reacts to them. And then you have what we call you have an antibody. So every time you eat that food, you're going to get an antibody response, which is an inflammatory response. So if it's food, part of it is you've got to clean up your eating habits. Okay, you've got to, if you're over 40, I think, you need to be taking hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzymes and bile salts because you probably aren't making it adequately anymore. And you've got to eat slowly. If you, aren't, you can't eat slowly, don't eat. You'll make it. You'll, you'll get, or have a piece of fruit, something simple to digest. Don't eat a, a cheeseburger. <laughs> And don't drink with your meals, because you dilute all those juices, and they don't work. See? Okay. This is why we get food allergies. And, and when babies are, are formula-fed, it's almost universal they're going to have food allergies. 
because most of them already have food allergies because of their moms. Some of these things cross the placenta and get in these antibodies cross the placenta. The baby can be sensitized before it's even born. Another fascinating thing is <coughs> what when a baby's born, the, the intestine's almost sterile. It's probably not totally sterile, but hardly anything's growing in there. Now, where does that stuff get started? We inoculate the baby's intestine when it gets is being born through the birth canal. Now, to get the right kind of the bugs in the baby, the mom's got to have the right kind of the bugs in her vagina and in her colon. Most moms don't. And so, before they're even born, no, they're actually doing now. When you have a C-section, you don't get that benefit because you come out through the tummy and you don't get inoculated. Well, then the next step really is when mom nurses it immediately and you get that claustrum, which stimulates the growth of the right kind of bacteria. Now, if those things don't work properly, then this is all messed up for life. It's almost impossible to correct it. But so what they're doing, they're doing a big study. It's going to be fascinating. They, if a mom's going to have a C-section, they put a, a, a some sort of a cotton ball or a swab in the vagina for a day or so before she's born before the operation, then right after the baby's born, they inoculate the baby with whatever is on that cotton, which helps circumvent the, the problem. They're doing some long-term studies of that. It's very, very interesting, but we're beginning to recognize, and this whole thing called the gap syndrome, you've heard that? It talks about the relationship between what's going on in your gut and what's going on in your brain. Because most of your immune system is right along here. Okay, so avoid if you can. Change your eating habits. Uh, increase your vitamins intake. Homeopathic <coughs> remedies can frequently help. And another very effective way of treating allergies is urine therapy. You should, if you've got a serious problem, you should read the book and seriously think about trying to overcome your <laughs> aversion to urine therapy. It's a wonderful therapy. It's cheap. It's very, very safe. It's very specific for you because you made your own uh, vaccine, and it's very, very effective. Read one of the books. Go online, Google urine therapy. You'll just, it's fascinating. But it took me a half hour my first time. <laughs> but it's not that bad. Anyway, okay, other important considerations are adrenal support. You just got it. We're all <coughs> stressed out. You know, life is just stressful. Thyroid therapy, if your basal temperatures are low. That, you know, thyroid deficiency is almost universal also. We talk about it. For all old age and all these diseases are manifestations of malnutrition, suboptimal nutrition, almost universal. I moved to Corvallis. I was stressed out. I hadn't ever moved in my life. My parents were getting a divorce. My diet was crappy. I left all my friends, and then I got this huge dose of grass ball. My brother did. But anyway, okay, what, what else can you do? Iodine. Take iodine's great. Everybody should probably be on iodine, because it helps sterilize the stuff in your gut. It helps balance your hormones. It's just a huge factor. It helps your thyroid. Clean up your environment, better digestion. And think about this substance called naltrexone. Naltrexone is something that helps a hyperactive immune system calm down. It helps a subactive adrenal in cancer, uh, um, immune system in people that may have cancer. helps it work better. So things like multiple sclerosis or chronic asthma or pancreatic cancer all get better with naltrexone. It's a great, I think probably most of us should be taking it occasionally, maybe where more. Where do you get it? You get it online. You can get it online. Uh, AntiAgingSystems.com, AntiAging-Systems.com. What are the consequences of doing naltrexone? Essentially, it's very, 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 I'm very safe. Anyway. It's very, very, very safe. It's not expensive, and it might help. And what's the consequences of not doing pan not doing naltrexone? Yeah, you should. You're not. Yeah. So, what's the consequence of taking too much vitamin C? Well, maybe gas. What's the consequence of not taking? Always consider the consequences of your action. And since most of the things, where's that piece of paper? And naltrexone is? Low dose. Naltrexone. Low dose. Called, low dose. 
That no, dose, no. no one's died from vitamin overdose. <laughs> like, that's straight from the government. So your, your safety margin is huge. 